that's probably the thing that's going to put you in the best position to be acquired or, or get bought at, at some point in the future. That's a really good point. When you first kicked Air Tasker off, did you ever consider that an IPO might be part of the deal? You've got to have like a North Star of like, want to build a multi-billion dollar huge business, but then you should probably spend most of your time thinking about how am I going to just get to the next step and survive the next step. We made a very sharp decision. You know, for, for us, it's been a mixed journey. Uh, part of it has been amazing and part of it's been pretty hard. It was, it's a tough environment. A lot of things you have to do. Now you've got a lot of shareholders you have to satisfy. You've got to be opportunistic. Mm. IPO is not right for everybody at every time. That's right, yeah. It's always a balancing act between strategic and opportunistic. Yeah, it's like, I guess, you know, going to the gym before you get into a boxing fight yeah, or something. Totally. You probably want to get your face punched in a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> But what they also should take out of this is that something you just said. Tim Fung, welcome to Going Public, mate. Thanks for having me, Mark. Good to see you again. Let's start off like this. Uh, who are you? What do you do? What's the deal? So I am uh, Tim Fung. I'm the co-founder and the CEO at Airtasker. Um, done a few things before this, but this is what I've been doing for the last 11 years of my life. So And loving it. And loving it. Give us a quick view on what Airtasker is doing. Sure. So we're a marketplace for local services. Our really simple mission is that we empower people to realize the full value of their skills. We believe that everybody's got unique skills. How are we going to help humans, people, uh, make money um, from their skills? And help customers or consumers too um, get a task done. Totally. Um, so it's a two-sided marketplace, customers getting stuff done. And, you know, by unlocking all the skills in your local community, there's all these things that you can get done that you might not have thought were possible. Um, and now we're making that possible. When you first kicked Airtasker off, did you ever consider that an IPO might be part of the deal? No, it's, a, it's an interesting thing I've been thinking about a lot recently. It's sort of like the lens of sort of long-term versus short-term. And one of the things I think that's quite healthy for like starting a business is you've got to have like a North Star of like long term, you want to build a multi-billion dollar huge business and, you know, all these cool things. But then you should probably spend most of your time thinking about like, how am I going to just get to the next step and survive the next step? It was funny. I was I was in Queensland recently and I was taking a walk with my with my wife and our and our young um, and our young baby. And she's like, oh, the ferry pools down at the water look really, really nice. Can you go check out whether we can go get to the ferry pools down near the water and if it's dangerous or not? And what I realized, uh, you know, in terms of analogies was if I looked at the ferry pools, which is where I wanted to go, I might've tripped on a rock on the way down and killed myself. Um, and so it kind of like made me realize you got to know that you're heading off to the ferry pools, but you mostly want to spend your time looking down at your feet and making sure that, you know, each step that you take is not the one that, that kind of kills you. Yeah, no, yeah that, that's, a, that's a pretty good analogy, actually. And uh, it's funny um, you should say that because some people do get distracted with the long-term outcome and they do trip over because they're missing out on the steps in front of them. I mean, I've been involved in lots of businesses and often I think about the end goal and the end goal like being maybe a 10-year goal. And often you can miss, what do they say, you miss the... Uh, the trees despite the forest, whatever the bloody saying is. But, <laughs> but uh, that, that's the point here. You, you've got to keep in mind your end goal, in your case, whatever it was, building a multi-billion dollar company. But equally, you've got to be doing looking at every single step along the way because every day is new steps and new, and new diversions and new, let's call them pivots, especially with all the things that happen these days with COVID, et cetera. Um, every day there's something in front of us. In terms of, though, uh, an IPO, did you ever say to yourself, maybe I'll sell it instead of doing an IPO? We never really thought about selling the business. And I think one of the things that, one of the things about building a platform business like like Airtasker is there's not like an obvious strategic buyer. You know, it's not like we're building some part of a supply chain that, you know, obviously Nike's gonna want that or, you know, Microsoft's gonna want that or something like that. Um, so I think what we're doing is fairly inherently sort of independent. It's just building its own thing. Um, so we didn't sort of plan or build around an acquisition and and we kind of like what we're doing. We kind of feel like, you know, there's something really big um, that, that we're building and we can take that into the long run. So never thought about acquisitions really. Being acquired as opposed to making acquisitions. Yeah, we never really thought about being acquired. That was never a goal for us. Um, to be honest, I didn't really think that much about the monetization event per se. Um, you know, we, we have genuine, and you know, I, I think that 
it's okay to talk about money. I think it's fine uh, to talk about that. Um, and of course, everyone wants to make a bunch of it. Um, but we never really sort of like built the business around a specific exit or monetization event that, that we wanted to have. Because there's often lots, lots of people talk about entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs is that they, from the day they start their business, they should be thinking about their exit. And I often say to people, well, well yeah, you can think about what exits there may be, but it doesn't mean that's the exit you're committed to. Mm. Um, IPO might be one, trade some might be another, um, um, JV with somebody where somebody takes a majority interest in the business might be another way, um, or another way, another way might just stay where you are <laughs> and oh. just continue earning money. You know, taking another sort of like contrarian position on, on sort of strategy, I kind of think that, you know, an exit is highly dependent on the counterparty actually wanting to acquire you or buy you or, or whatever it is. And so you can't, there's only a limit to how strategic you can be about that. You know, because if that person doesn't want to buy you or acquire you, you may actually do a lot of things that aren't smart uh, in the interest of, you know, positioning yourself to be acquired and uh, that aren't actually good for the for the sh for the long term of the business you're building. So I think the main thing is like focus on build the business and do what's right for the business. And um, ironically, that's probably the thing that's going to put you in the best position to be acquired or, or get bought at, at some point in the future. That's a really good point. Always do what is in the best interest of the business which means you do what is in the best interest of shareholders as well. So you're not being particularly influenced by anybody. Um, and that will give you the best outcome. I agree with that. Can you remember when you you guys first sat down and thought, okay, we're going to IPO? What period? When are we talking about? What period of time? Yeah. So um, it was actually during COVID. So the lead up to it was that we, you know, we spent the first seven years or so building the business, um, thankfully, during really good um, times for raising money. And so every year we'd raise around round of money, it'd be twice as much as the year before, and we'd burn that money to build out the network effect in the marketplace of Airtasker. Did you keep getting up rounds? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty smooth sailing. And, you know, it was, frankly, I feel very thankful and a lot of gratitude to the fact that, you know, um, we were able to build for eight years before we kind of felt a market correction. You know, I think you're really unlucky, basically, if you started building a business in 2019 or something, um, if, if you got corrected. So... Um, we were, we, we had been on that cycle of burning a lot of money. 2019, we were burning something like 30 million a year or two and a half million bucks a month, which was pretty uh, harrowing. We got the company into, um, we made a very sharp decision. Um, we couldn't raise any more money. We've got to get this company from to privates. be profitable from privates, yep. mainly because in Australia, there's only a limited number of people who'll write a $50 million check for a, you know, cash burning, uh, company. Um, and we were very, th we, we ended up getting profitable in about nine months. Um, so we, we had a very high operating leverage business model. We were able to just cut off a bit of marketing and, and get profitable. Then COVID came around and, um, there was definitely an initial disruption, but it really made us realize that our business is very, very resilient to change because it's a platform business. Customers and taskers rallied around our business and, and continued to build it during COVID. And so we thought, hey, can we take this thing overseas and expand into the US and the and the UK? But we needed to raise money to do that. And so, you know, we looked at all the different options. And um, I think at the time, Afterpay was doing like a masterclass in, you know, using the public markets to be able to raise a lot of money and 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 scale. And so we thought that looks pretty good. Um, let's try that. So you took, so you looked at Afterpay, and Afterpay became your proxy for what would be a good thing for you guys to do. Yeah, I think what they sort of showed is they had a product that was working. They needed to do expansion into sales and marketing, you know, in the United States. And they were able to sort of tell enough of a story to get a good share price, a good valuation, raise the money, go and deliver on the first part of that story and do it again. Um, and, you know, it turns out that they kind of did the absolute masterclass, I think, in in sort of raising capital and getting all the timing right and all that kind of thing. And timing was brilliant. It was, it was brilliant. Um, and so we thought that that, that that looks pretty good. You know, for, for us, it's been a mixed journey. Uh, part of it has been amazing and part of it's been pretty hard. It was. It's a tough environment because there's a lot of things you have to do. You now you've got a lot of shareholders you have to satisfy. What year was it that you actually decided to go public, in other words, to IPO the business? What year? It was um, September 2020. Yeah. And we were public by sort of March 2021. So, so can you take me through the process? For us, it was like an absolute whirlwind. You know, six months from, hey, this is a good idea to um, actually get listed. Um, I guess the, the big chunks were, it's probably like the legal um, side of things and then the sort of banking and corporate finance um, side of things. Um, as a technology company as well, we had to really um, get super rigorous with like cyber 
um, you know, and all the governance that happens in within our tech stack. In order to satisfy um, your your potential shareholders that, that might be that's right, in like to, to basically um, satisfy the auditors, you know. So there's a you know a list of something like a thousand items of um, general IT controls that you have to have in the business, and and honestly that was like a really good thing for us because we sort of went through and we're like oh geez like a lot of uh, our engineers could actually just transfer you know, $100 million from this account to that account without actually getting my sign off on it. That, that's pretty crazy. So, um, so that yeah. was a good exercise, a good cleansing exercise. I think it was a great exercise. It's basically like doing due diligence for a cap raise, um, but kind of doing it once and for all. And so, you know, when we were private, we still basically had to do a lot of these things. It's just that it would be nothing for a year. And then you're trying to raise around from a, you know, from a venture capitalist and you had to do all of this stuff to, to satisfy them. I think when you're publicly listed, um, it's more like you do all of that work up front and you kind of do it once and for all. And then from then on, you're effectively, you know, um, your due diligence clean. Yeah, and you have a due diligence sort of platform. So you, you, you've you sort of effectively created a room, digital, um, where you can actually add to it or subtract from it or you can upgrade it or refine it or improve it or whatever. But it's always, it's live. Yeah, that's right. And and things like having, you know, independent directors on your board is like a, you know, consistent reminder of governance and, and things like that. Um, so look, there is extra work involved for sure. Um, but um, I think it was quite healthy for us. And I think particularly being like a consumer product where we're trying to build trust in the community, it's quite a good signaling to say, hey, you know, um, a lot of people have put us through the, the rigor um, that it requires to be a public company. So I, I think um, it's probably important to, for people to understand that when you pick a sponsoring broker, they ordinarily, before they go off and list you, they ordinarily get their corporate team to come in and look at the deal because yeah. you know they're putting their name behind it to, and to their clients usually. Um, that corporate team is the team that actually would give you a list of things that they want you to satisfy or they want you to answer. Yeah. So they're, they're sort of doing due diligence on you, on your business. That's yeah, it's the, pretty much like a capital raise in that sense. You know, you've got somebody who really cares about whether this business is going to work post listing, um, and so they put a lot of you know a um, lot of rigor into that um, decision making. And yeah, there's probably six months of intense you know weekends, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, um, doing work um, to to make that happen. But it was a pretty satisfying event when we got there. When you raised your money, was it about people exiting, or was it more about raising money? so that you could get more capital to expand, say, for example, in the United States? Well, it was the classic case where the founder, i.e. me, was saying, I think this company is worth so much more than uh, all these people that, you know, the, the corporate deal makers. Um, and so I was like, hey, I don't want to like take on a bunch of dilution at this uh, valuation. Turns out that valuation is a lot higher than where we are today, but, um, you know, due to the market effects mostly. But I didn't want to raise a lot of capital. Um, we did have one big shareholder, which was Channel 7, uh, who had been an incredible um, supporter and backer of the business for about five years. They'd helped us sort of 20x revenue, 10x our brand awareness, and they'd done an incredible uh, job, and we wanted to give them an opportunity to exit. So it's predominantly them exiting, um, a few of our early um, angel investors and stuff taking some money off the table, um, but most of the big investors staying in. Um, so we only raised about $15 million of primary capital, I think. In that capital that you're, you're deploying. That's right. So it was an $85 million... Um, IPO, and you know, seventy million of it went out to you know Channel Seven and a bunch of investors, and about fifteen million came into the business. Right, so that that's a pretty important point. So, um, if you want to keep your original investors in the case in the case of Channel Seven happy, because they they they're always looking for an exit at some stage. Right? Well, they had something like six hundred million dollars, like pretty publicly. They had a lot of debt on their balance sheet, and I think the new CEO it it had moved from Tim Warner to uh, James Warburton and um, Tim Warner, you know, was an incredible backer of the business, was on our board for a while and things like that. The new CEO had come in to, you know, clean up some of the debt um, in the business. And so, you know, they had a public imperative to be raising cash. And so, you know, having Airtasker on their balance sheet with an opportunity to sell out for, you know, 10X, um, their, uh, 5X, sorry, their, uh, their initial investment was pretty good. Uh, yeah. And IPO actually lends itself to that. I mean, you could have gone and found, found somebody to take seven out altogether as a just as a private tra trade but if you list the business that allows you to effectively split up channel sevens 
shareholding in your in their task amongst a whole lot of other people, like a stack of other people. Oh, I mean, it was to to paint the contrast between now and you know the current sort of um, late twenty three uh, macro sort of cratering of of growth tech to twenty twenty one that period. I think our IPO was something like eight or ten x oversubscribed, and so it was like for wow. the eighty million dollars that we wanted. We had hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars um, being um, effectively unilaterally offered to you. So, you know, if you wanted to take that much, you could take it. We could have had, you know, the company bought out three times over. Um, and it was, it, you know, looking back on that, it was quite interesting because, you know, um, the brokers would come around to me and say, oh, can you just throw that institutional investor, just throw them, a, throw them a bit, you know, just to get them, you know, whet their appetite for, for, for buying into the business. Um, and now I think the market is, you know, the extreme opposite, which is um, it's it'd be incredibly difficult to raise, you know, even a small amount of money at any sort of meaningful valuation. So how important is timing? So um, and and how were you approached, or did or how did you approach sponsoring brokers, et cetera, That the team, that sort of the list of people that you need to rely on to help you get this thing executed upon. I think the IPO window is only open at certain points, and um, we are probably relative to industries. Yeah, d- definitely. Like yeah. so, right now, I think you can list a, a lithium mine or something because yeah. batteries are hot. But I think a um, a loss making a tech company right now would be virtually impossible to 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 list. So, I think there are only I'd, I'd characterize it more as there are only certain windows in a market where you can do this. Um, so I think you know the timing's not entirely up to you, um, but you know we're certainly open in 2020, 2021, which I think is hilarious because most people would think that. You know, you have a pandemic that would close the IPO window, but it actually um, made it very much open. Yeah, the timing wasn't exactly strategic, it was probably more opportunistic that at the time that we needed to make a strategy call, there were only a number of opportunities that we could have gone for. I think um, as a predominantly Australian company, it was very difficult to raise growth equity. You know, a $40, $50 million round predominantly still comes out of the United States. And I think, you know, we've got great companies like Canva, Safety Culture, Atlassian, um, CultureAmp, who have international businesses day one. You know, they, they, they've got US customers. And so I think you can raise money from US hedge funds and US growth funds when you have US customers. But for us, we went to the United States and people were like, what's Airtasker? I've never heard of Airtasker. I'm not going to give you a $50 million check for, for that. Um, and so we didn't really have that option. And, and so, you know, IPO became a very interesting one for us. In terms of your IPO, you were able to exit a couple of shareholders who you know, wanted to exit um, because they've been, they've been supporting you for a long time. Because I, I remember this is pre-COVID and there was always Airtasker ads on Channel 7. Yeah. And I used to think to myself, they've done uh, what I did with Channel 9 many, many years ago. That's um, Channel 7 have done with you what I did with Channel 9 many, many years ago. That was um, to invest in you and, and then use their platforms to build your brand. Mm-hmm. But it comes a time when they want to go. Of course, because yeah. that's not their that's not their core business. Yeah, no, that, and that was the best thing about our relationship with Seven. I think is it wasn't strategic in the sense of um, you know them wanting to somehow enter the jobs market with us or for them to own the service economy. It was strategic in the sense of they have really good marketing assets, and we needed to get out to market and make Airtasker a household brand, and so. Um, we we pretty much used them, you know, used that platform to to achieve our objectives, um, and then you know we were able to fly from the coop, um, and you know we were super stoked, and and they were really happy too. Given that you effectively raised fifteen million dollars in terms of free cash, mm-hmm. as opposed to the total amount which allowed some people to exit, what is the the fifteen million dollars? In terms of the story that you needed to tell to the shareholders that were going to come onto the register. What did you need to have to pitch them? Do they are they looking for an expansion story, or are they looking for a profit story at the time? Predominantly, we had built a business that was fast growing in Australia, um, was showing um, uh, operating cash flow positive uh, in Australia, and we basically have a very high operating leverage model, where we can go into a new country and use essentially the t- same tech stack that we've invented, you know, and where um, Australians are using, and let U.S. people and U.K. Uh, people use that same tech stack. And so that's incredibly high operating leverage, um, you know, selling the same software to um, to new users. For us, we need to replicate marketing and brand into the um, into the market. Um, but uh, but yeah, we don't need to replicate those technology costs. When you were going through the process of 
speaking to potential new shareholders, institutions, etc. Does the sponsoring broker take you along? And was it you or somebody else within your organization? Perhaps you might just uh, sort of map it out for me. Do you go along with the CFO or what are they looking for? How are the presentations made? Yeah, well, it was quite interesting because, you know, this was the move to Zoom. So usually- oh, Of course, I think, it's COVID, of course. Yeah, so I think back, you know, pre-COVID, it used to be get on a plane yeah. and do a, you know, two weeks of being on a plane to Perth, Brisbane, Adelaide, you know, you have to travel the country. Um, for us, you know, I guess you could say that's exciting um, or, or, or less so or, or annoying. Um, what we did was basically hole up in a room and have um, Zoom on and just be doing back to back to back meetings all day. And so in some ways it's very efficient because you could, you know, I think in the old days you would, you know, have to have a meeting for an hour and then travel an hour to the next meeting. This was like just a brutal sort of, I think the most we did was like 11 or 12 sort of back to back one hour meetings. Um, and it was myself and the CFO, um, our CFO, Nathan, um, who, um, who were just doing them back to back to back. And, and they're effectively a pitch. It's a pitch. So you're pitching to these potential investors about your, your, your market segment, about what you do that's different. Uh, and you're probably, they're probably asking about forecasts and they're probably asking about growth. They, they sort of pretty much the, the four things and maybe brand. Yeah, I think for us, there was a little bit about like, say, um, government and um, things like that, you know. What, we're how do you a, mean? Well, we're in the, um, an interesting part of the jobs market where, um, uh, you know, the government is looking to introduce legislation and, you know, so there was different ah, yeah, questions yeah, yeah, around yeah, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, well, that, that's about risk. Is yeah, that, yeah. So they were risk. asking about some of those risks yep. and we had to have good, um, you know, good supporting and justification for that. How do you prepare the Q&A? So you make your pitch, you know, say, hello, everybody. This is my CFO. My name's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm, I'm from Airtasker and this is what we do. And, um, you know, we're looking at IPO. But then you, you turn over to them, to the to the institutions you're talking to or, or you might be actually talking to a desk at a broker. How did you sort of build that out? And did you keep adding to it after every Zoom meeting? Yep. So the good thing is we'd had a lot of practice because, you know, we'd raised funds, you know, from venture capitalists. And, you know, those venture capitalists are pretty on it. You know, they're going to ask you every detailed question about LTVs, CACs, you know, how you're getting expansion on that. You know, so we'd been through the ringer many, many um, times before. Slightly different audience, um, I would say. One of the things that I think is um, that we've kind of coined is doing nasty Q&As. So basically, I would sit in a room, and um, you know, our um, our advisor, um, uh, capital advisors, would basically just grill me with all these like basically mean questions, <laughs> like you know, uh, trying to pick a hole in in something, and and you know, that's how you sort of get the training, so that you know, when you go in and and you get grilled by hedge fund managers and stuff, you know, you predominantly covered off a lot of the you know things that that could be tricky questions. So sort of try and prepare you for prepare you for anything. Yeah, it's like, I guess, you know, going to the gym before you get into a boxing fight yeah, or something. Totally. You probably want to get your face punched in a couple of times to, you know, uh, do that in a less consequential environment before you, you know, to go to a fight at MGM Grand or something. If you were now trying to do this again, what, what are the sort of things you would look for in your sponsoring broker? Um, I think the research and the commitment to research and analysis is pretty important. By um, them, by them. By them and, and helping, you know, try to expand that network out. Um, that's definitely been one hard thing about um, the position we're in. We, we sort of listed as a small cap with a market cap of 250 mil. It went up to like 800 mil straight away on, on day one. But, you know, we kind of came out as a small cap. And now, you know, with the difficulties in the share price and the share markets and lack of liquidity, we're probably more a micro cap. And so we just don't have the depth of research coverage and analysis um, that, that we would like to have, you know, it'd be great to have more um, analysts and stuff covering us. So I think that's probably one thing that I would um, love to be different. What did you learn at the time? Like, did you have to have, in terms of lawyers, um, do you have to have a big four, a chart accounting firm doing your audits? What are the things that you would pick out of that period that you think you could improve upon because you were successful in your listing anyway? But because a lot of people say, oh, we've got to have a big four, chart accounting firm, whatever that big five, whatever that. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Mm. Um, no, that's a that's a great point. Um, we had actually, we we basically um, uh, ran a process to you know pick the um, the advisors that we'd go with, and then the um, the the law firm uh, that we'd go with, and then the auditors. And in all cases, we sort of had a premium, um, a, you know, really really high end top tier 
um, lawyer and um, and broking firm, and then also a uh, a mid tier. And we ended up going with mid tier for um, for both the the broker and the um, and the lawyers that we used. And I think that was really appropriate because they really cared about us. Like the level of service and care for you know they were literally working weekends, Christmas Day, New Year's Day with us. Um, and I think um, you know when we had engaged with some of the bigger top tier firms. Um, you know, you're a drop in their ocean. Um, so, you know, a 250 million IPO for a Macquarie Bank or a Goldman Sachs or something like that is is chump change, you know, in the context of what they'd be doing if they were doing a two or $3 billion listing. Sounds ridiculous, but you're probably... I know. Right. It, it, you're probably it's right. quite funny. Everyone feels uncomfortable when they go, look, you know, for $4 million, I just don't know if I can get out of bed for this. And yeah. you're kind of like... What the hell? I think uh, $4 million for six months of work is pretty good. Yeah, um, I definitely get out of bed. Yeah, I'm getting out of bed every day for $4 million. Yeah, yeah. You know? even Christmas Day. Yeah. And and it's, and in terms of your orders, do you, do you just select a, one of the big the big, uh, big tier accounting firms? Or? Yeah, we're with Deloitte. Um, I've had a great relationship um, with um, Josh, Josh Tanchel um, is a, is a, the partner there, and he's actually been an incredible part of the sort of startup community. Um, and so, you know, he, he's been doing a lot of sort of sweat equity for people to to build those relationships. And so, we've known him since in 2013 when we started. He's always he's, been your auditor. Uh, no, hasn't, no, no, we only had an audit, uh, an auditor, you know. A couple of years before we listed, uh, but no, Josh just he's he's at the startup events talking right. uh, about things that you might be thinking about if you're going to eventually list, and so that set him up really well for for us to have that relationship. So Tim, you saw him at the startup events. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. A, he's he loves it. He's um he's um you know bringing great venture capitalists from you know the United States and has dinners at the Deloitte office and you know getting. That engagement, so he's really paying it forward, and and um, I think it's a genuine part of the startup community, which is pretty cool. How important was it for you, um, in terms of being at least familiar and therefore comfortable with doing an IPO, to network with people who put on these events and bring in these experts like the guy from Deloitte? I think it kind of just happened naturally. Like it certainly wasn't uh, the case that you're like, ah, oh, if I'm going to IPO in ten years, who might I need to know to get there? I think it's you know it's probably that classic thing of just looking down at your feet and making sure you don't slip. Um, in the early days, it was like, hey, we need to speak to a lot of angel investors because you know we need to raise, you know, a couple of million bucks, and you know we need people to, who can write us a check of two hundred grand or five hundred grand, and that sort of progressed then to speaking to um, to venture capitalists and and things like that, and then that sort of progressed, and and now where we are is we're talking to a lot of you know hedge funds and, and things like that. So I guess the network just sort of grew as it needed to grow. A lot of people I know, they sit down, because I, mean, I do these things all the time, they sit down and they uh, they build a map out and they say, well, from, you know, we're going to start up today, we need to do, like you just said, we need to raise some money from angels and we need to do a, you know, round A, round B, round C, and then we're going to list it or we're going to we're going to IPO it. That's sort of a pretty familiar um, track that they, people go down. But they never actually go and talk to anyone about these things. Mm. They never go and say, well, by the way, what's it like to do is, uh, uh, the first round or the A round, the B round, who do you talk to? They many most people don't even think about for a second what's it like to do an IPO. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's what this whole show is about, is to get people get a sense of and become comfortable. So you're effectively standing in the shoes of the Deloitte's guy that you just mentioned. What's his name? Josh? Josh yeah. 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 So I mean if because a lot of people is thinking, oh that well, if Tim did that and he had a good experience at the time and raised the money and was able to allow some of his bigger shareholders bigger shareholders to exit, that makes me comfortable. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a process I might be prepared to go down. But what they also should take out of this is that something you just said. You've got to be opportunistic. Mm -hmm. IPO is not right for everybody at every time. Because you've, totally. you've got to look where the money is being attracted to. Totally. And in your case, during COVID, it was attracted to gross tech, tech stocks. That's right. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, look, I think it's always a balancing act between strate strategic and opportunistic. Um, I think the, I think the, the issue that we have right now is there's a lot of like wisdom on like medium blogs and stuff like that, which sort of like create these platitudes of you've got to think everything's got to be long term and everything's got to be strategic. And that... If you're starting from a point of, or you know, I'm very short term and I'm very, you know, overly opportunistic, that is true. You want to index that way. But I think now that, you know, people almost speak about it like everything's got to be strategic, everything's got to be long term. And I actually think the pendulum probably has to swing a little bit the other way where entrepreneurs, you know, you may well be dead before 
you know, from a business perspective, you may well be dead before you get to that long-term strategic outcome that you want. And we don't, and these days we don't know what's ahead of us either. We don't know there's a, a pandemic coming. We don't know, and we don't know the effect of the pandemic. Like who would have thought a pandemic would have actually swung liquidity mm. back in favour of growth tech growth stocks? Do, yeah, like especially got to that level. Like it was pretty wild. I was like, and I think our outcome was, um, yeah, like the, the the listing event wasn't that wild. I think we listed at a um, a revenue multiple of sort of nine times tra- trailing revenue which I don't think was like crazy at the time, um, but it definitely was reflected after we listed that we were, ended up trading at 40 or 50 times uh, revenue for, for a moment there. Wow. And um, lots of other um, you know, companies were raising capital at that, at that sort of level too. And, and in terms of being listed, do you find that there's a, a lot of work required to feed back to your shareholders? I mean, do you, like it's not marketing, but it's shareholder management. Look, I think um, it was really interesting. It, it depends on where you sort of start from. I definitely think it's more work compared to being in a private company. In a private company, um, you know, you've probably got three or four at the most sort of like big, you know, venture capital investors, and you do need to go and communicate to them and, you know, maybe send them a monthly newsletter, share the financials and get them up to speed. But they're super engaged. You know, if they've written you a check for five or $10 million, they care and they're going to, you know, um, talk through that. So it's definitely more work than that. Because now you're dealing with, you know, we have, I think, 17,000 shareholders or something, and they're not going to put in the effort to read a long newsletter and understand all the nuances of the business and stuff. And so it is more work than that. But I do think it's less work than what most founders are kind of told by venture capitalists about listing. Like, I think, you know, it's very much in the interest of the private investors to tell you, oh, the public market, you don't want to go there. Their money's and it's going to cost you a lot of work. Come and take my money from the private market. And so I think like a lot of founders get told, don't ever list, just stay private. Um, and it's quite funny because most of that narrative, I think, comes from the private market investors. Of course it does. And of course, as a private market investor, your incentive is to tell the person, like, my capital is effectively cheaper for you. And, and better. And, and better. So take my money, um, which is kind of funny because, like, money is the ultimate commodity. But I, but I, but I agree with you. I don't, that's not my experience either. My experience is actually it's a lot less intense. Yeah, it wasn't as bad as I thought. It's basically. repetitive. Yeah. You have to do it a lot, yeah. but it's less intense. Yep. And it's part of your marketing too. Like, you know, you know, it's always a question about should you be doing this anyway? You know, you may not enjoy doing it. Like I don't particularly enjoy doing the the IT audit for the business, but it's also something that I probably should be doing. Um, and so, you know, getting your butt whooped to go and do that every quarter or every half year, it's probably a good thing. So overall, the rigor that initially gets applied to you before you listed or before you did the IPO and the rigor that sort of the continual rigor and also the continual disclosure requirements. In other words, stuff you need to know about your business and the fact that you've got to continue to disclose that. That's actually quite a good rigor. I, I've, I've, yeah, I've always totally. had- Like to, to, to fill in a cash flow statement, it was, we, we still have to submit a, Every um, quarter. a 4C quarterly cash flow statement. Yep. Um, and I think that's pretty important. Like as a yeah. founder, you probably want to be under the grill for how is your cash going? And if it's too high, you probably want someone slapping you in the face and saying, bring your cash burn down um, uh, or, you know, um, invest more and that's great. But you want to be having that rigor, I think. No, I agree. The, I think the rigor that the ASX applies is very good. And it's, it doesn't, it's not very good just for the fact you've got to apply rigor, but it's very good for the business. It's, it's quite a good discipline. Mm. And then, then of course- At you, the right stage, by the way. Yeah, I, no, think, I, I think, you know, if you were trying to start a startup- Forget it. That'd be terrible. Yeah. But I think, you know, if you're doing a couple of hundred million dollars of turnover and things like that, it probably starts to make sense, the trade-offs. Well, this has been uh, great to catch up with you again, Tim. Um, Tim Fung, CEO and co-founder of Airtasker. And watch, uh, by the way, what's your ticker? Uh, Art, A-R-T. Perfect. Get out there.